tackle and and uh you know then moving on to Jalen Tate at at six six um to have a guy that can play the point guard position with his length his defensive ability you're talking about you know in, in at the division one level being the defensive player of the year uh three time all defensive player in his conference um you know Every year he's played college basketball, he's been on the all-defensive team. Uh, somebody that we felt uh, losing Jimmy Witt's ability to guard the best player on the other team, whether it's a one, two, or three, Jalen now allows us to do that. He does. He's a very good rebounder for his position. Um, so I think he also gives us great flexibility um, just as Jimmy Witt did and, and just like Caleb and Cody Martin did for us at, at Nevada. Um, you know, and then obviously, you know, Devo, Devontae Davis is a guy that, that can play both guard spots and has great length and, and uh, a guy that's been committed and excited um, all the way back from November and, and somebody that's, that's got great pride in, in being a Razorback player. So, um, you know, both, both the new guys, Vance and Jalen, I mean, they've been asking for their paperwork for several days and had to wait until, you know, this morning to get it. They're, they were excited to sign They they want to be here. Uh, they've handled everything with great professionalism, incredible maturity. Um, you know, they've shown leadership throughout the process on how they deal with us. They pick up the phone every time we call them, uh, both guys return every text message. Um, we've had in-depth conversations about not only basketball, but, but life as well. Um, they've asked a ton of questions about things like they should. And, and, um, you know, we're excited about all three of these guys. Hey, with, with, uh, with Vance looking up, uh, your last year in Nevada, I think you guys were 14 and now rank six going into Albuquerque. And he had like, I wrote a diner, 18 points, 10 boards, seven Assist, three steals, pretty, pretty good game. Uh, what kind of impression did that make on you, and how much did that uh, make you want to add him to your team now? Yeah, I mean, off that particular team, Bob, obviously we were rolling, being undefeated in the top, whatever, 10 in the country. Uh, we felt like his versatility was the only player uh, in our conference at the time that, that could match our guys versatility because you know we we had four guys that could kind of play four positions and and Vance kind of you know negated that um you know he's been known to step up in big games obviously New Mexico's biggest game that year was was when we went in there they had their biggest crowd of the year um he stepped up against a ranked team and dominated the game and uh, it's interesting because when, when he verbally committed, um, I would say seven to eight of the guys off the Nevada team, um, you know, have texted me that particular day because um, our guys had tremendous respect for him. And, and then just what he's done in the Mountain West tournament in Las Vegas, um, you know, he's even got a nickname for, for how he's performed in Vegas, um, you know, in, in, in conference tournament settings. What's what's the nickname? I think it's Vegas Vance, but I guess somebody'd have to look it up. Okay, I'll look that up. Well, I've got twenty-seven more questions, but I'll defer and let that <laughs> let it go back. No one believes that it's only twenty-seven, Bob. Yeah. <laughs> I don't either. Nate, do you have any questions? Uh, yeah. Um... Eric, I guess just with adding Vance and then with who you may also add uh, and, and having Connor, just with the size, how differently do you think you'll be playing in style next year compared to how you played this year so small? Yeah, I mean, I think obviously just, you know, you look at the at the team uh, makeup and, and uh, you know, we are going to be bigger. We're going to be stronger. Um you know, but we still want to play, you know, we, we still want to play with pace. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, when you, when you look at like Connor and, and Vance, like up front, um, we'll probably, even though we're much bigger, 
we will shoot more threes, um, you know, at least at the five spot with Connor and, 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 and obviously Vance being more of a traditional four man than we played last year. Um, you know, he's going to take a lot of threes at that position as well. And as, as far as just uh, with kind of multiple point guards, you talked about uh, maybe playing Isaiah some at point. Is that still uh, still in, in your, what you plan on doing? Is working him some at point guard as well? No, I, I think Isaiah will be. You know, he's. You know, again, I mean, he's still. Uh, you know, he and his family still have. You know, discussions about testing the waters and and um, you know. So I mean, right now. You know, I'm sure that, the, you know, the focus is, is, is probably on that decision-making process. And, um, you know, I think that for sure we want Isaiah, if he comes back, we want Isaiah to uh, be in more ball-handling situations. But, um, you know, I think he can do that at that off-guard spot as well. Uh, but we want to put Isaiah in more pick-and-roll situations and more isolation-type things that we use Mason with. Um, you know, but I, I don't think necessarily at the point because, you know, we use Mason at that point forward, but, but he really wasn't a, a point guard. You know, Jimmy was, was our point guard. And I think that, you know, with Jalen and, and JD and Devo, I mean, I think we have multiple guys that can, that can, that can do that for us right now. And also with Mason, anything, I mean, is there any chance of him coming back? Do you feel he's definitely, uh, you know, I guess he hasn't hired an agent yet, but are you, kind of counting him as not coming back at this point. Yeah, I mean, we're just, we're proceeding as if, you know, I mean, it's from all indications, it sounds like, you know, that's the challenge that he's looking towards. But, um, you know, I think it's, it, you know, we, we kind of supply uh, the feedback that we've gotten from NBA teams to Mason and his family, and then it's it's up to them. And we, 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 we've done all the research that we can do up to this point um have talked to 23 nba teams supplied them the information and and um you know we support all of our guys in any of their professional um you know aspirations and we're behind them 100 percent whatever decision they make and and um you know the only thing that we can do is provide information uh through our multiple many many contacts that we have i appreciate it thank you that's all i got Kevin, do you have any questions? Yeah, um, hey, Moss. Um, when you look at the grad transfer portal, you, you obviously got, uh, and, and uh, traditional transfers, you got five guys last year, two this year. Spring signing used to be sort of a supplementary part of recruiting, and now it's almost like front-end recruiting because you can build a roster with so much transient nature of it. You're almost sometimes replacing half the roster. Do you think the strategy that you've had in the last couple of years at Arkansas kind of puts Arkansas ahead of the curve because of the outreach and how much attention Arkansas gets on social media, even from the national uh, recruiting uh, analysts who have Arkansas's name nearly in every tweet that goes out about transfers. You know, I mean, I think that, you know, that just the, the nature and the complexion of, of um, college athletics with the transfer market have, have kind of um, changed um, it's even like this year, it's more competitive on the transfer market than it was last year. And, you know, certainly four years ago, it, it was not difficult at all for us to get transfers because we were a little bit ahead of a lot of programs, especially a lot of power fives. Now all power fives are recruiting um, transfers. And certainly there's been talk of potential new rule changes coming either in the very near future or in the future. And that's going to change the landscape even more dramatically where you're going to be building rosters almost annually. Um, and so, you know, that's just kind of, it's, it's not just basketball. It's going to, it's going to happen in all sports. And, and um, you know, so I think that, that having a pulse on that is, is extremely important because it's, it's just as important as any other way that you would recruit or try to get talent, you know, to your, to your roster. Thank you.
Kevin, is that all you've got? Yeah, yeah, that's it. Okay. Hutch? Yeah, Coach, I was uh, – Jalen was, was hurt when Northern Kentucky played y'all earlier this season, but did you get to see him on film at all when you were preparing for that game, or did you have any familiarity with him before uh, recruiting him during this process? Yeah, Hutch, I mean, was, you know, with all of our guys, um, when we play a team – uh, we always prepare, even if a guy's injured, we always meet as a staff and go through strengths and weaknesses, or I should say, not the whole staff, but myself and one or two guys will, will go over every player, even the injured players. We were extremely concerned um, whether he would play or not. Um, we thought he was so dangerous in so many different areas, whether it was the defensive disruptor, whether it was his ability to dribble drive. We knew he could make a three. Um, so, yes, we did prepare as if he was going to play. Um, and so I think that that helped from a familiarity standpoint. Once he entered the portal, we knew right away that, that he was going to be our top target, um, you know, at that position. Yeah, that kind of leads me to my second question. You know, Vance, you had a firsthand experience. You've already talked about playing him. I mean, does it make it easier or more comfortable to recruit a transfer when are you had that up close and personal experience against them? Yeah, I don't think there's any doubt. You know, I think that, you know, just as an NBA team, when they evaluate for the draft, they would much prefer to watch a guy live. Um, and live eyeballs tell a lot more of the story. Um, certainly than, than, you know, than watching on tape. On tape, you really can't tell how quick a guy is or you're not quite as sure. You can't tell how tall somebody – like I know, I know exactly what Vance Jackson is. Um, I feel because we were trying to prepare uh, for, for Jalen Tate that, you know, um, that it certainly helped. Uh, tremendously in the evaluation process, I guess. Mm -hmm. The last one I have now, uh, what, what was this process like recruiting these guys with the, you know, the virus, not being able to have guys in for visits and what was it any different this year than uh, years past? It was certainly different than the last two years because the last two years transfer stuff has, has turned into, much like the high school where you have in-home visits, you fly, meet with the, you know, the transfer. My first two years at Nevada, that was not the case. Um, we could, we could basically pick up the phone, um, have several conversations, kind of explain our, you know, who we are, what we were all about, um, and still be able to land a transfer, maybe even without a visit. But certainly that has not been the case the last two years. But, um, yeah, you've got to get creative. Um, you've got to be able to show your prospective recruit everything you possibly can without them showing up. And certainly um, it's been a, a, an effort by a lot of different people putting things together in a very, very, very short amount of time. And I think that we're – on equal ground, if not further ahead than, than most people because of the work ethic of, um, you know, I mean, the stuff that Coach Mosier's done and the stuff that Pat Eckerman's done and Michael Musselman and Anthony Root and Hayes Myers, like those, those guys in particular have just been in here, in grinding and trying to come up with video footage of virtual things and, and, um, you know, we've gotten help from the marketing department. They've been incredible and from the sports information department. So it's been a full family um, affair to try to put together. You know, we didn't know this was going to, we didn't, you know, this just kind of happened. And all of a sudden you're recruiting without unofficial visits and without official visits and um, without doing in-home visits. So certainly it dramatically changed the game and, um, you know, we've been involved in so many different recruits since our season ended and the feedback we've gotten, even if it's with players that have gone elsewhere, or even if it's been exploratory conversations and, and we've kind of decided to go in a different direction. The feedback we've gotten has been 
has been really, really positive on, on, on how we've gone about conducting recruiting um, with, with the virus. All right, that's all I got for now, Coach. Thanks. Thanks, Doug. Trent. Hey, Coach. Um, I have kind of a similar question as Andrew, but uh, just a little more timeline based. Like, so when you're hitting refresh, your staff's hitting refresh on the uh, transfer portal, and Jalen Tate and Vance Jackson's names pop up. What is the what is the next step after that in in recruiting? I guess from from that point of seeing their name to when you know when they actually sign today. Like what what is the next step after seeing their names? Yeah, I mean the first step is you know when we at least for us. I mean I don't know how other people do it, but um, we have our own internal email um, that. You know, we look up the stats, look up where he's from. Um, you know, we have our own, I don't know how to word it. We have our own statistical um, eval money ball type, you know, but Oakland A's, our own analytics where we try to plug in the number that that player's at and then how that would, would, would forecast into, you know, into, into the SEC. And then I watch film um, and then we reach out, you know, in the portal, you know, the way, what they usually, the information you're given is usually an email and you, you know, you email or you try to get a hold of a high school coach or somebody that you might know um, to try to track down a player's number. And then, and then from there, you just, you know, some guys are very interested. Some guys text back, some guys email back some you never hear from um you know we feel like you know the interaction or at least getting a hold of the the the, the transfer we've we've pretty documented we've we've gotten a hold of most of the top guys and, and had conversations and been in the been in the been in the arena with them at least and coach you've uh i mean you've got some guys that are still unsigned right now but I mean, it looks like at the least that you'll have nine players who haven't played an actual game as a Razorback next year. Have you have you been in a situation like that? You might have been in the NBA or something, but in, in college, have, have you been in a situation like that? Yeah, I, th- I think it's really similar to even our first – after our first year at Nevada, I'd have to go back and, and look it up. But, it's, it's, again, I'm only guessing that you guys do way more better research than me, but I'm going to assume it's – it's 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 pretty much the same thing as far as um, number of guys and and uh, you know certainly when you plan ahead you know we didn't you know 12 months ago we didn't plan ahead you know and think you know we'd have guys testing the waters and 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 you know so there's there's a lot of factors that that go into building a roster but certainly. Um, it's not just us. I mean, you can, you can look at other programs in our, in our own conference with coaching staff that have been in place for quite some time and the turnover on those rosters, um, the number of players that have put their name in the draft. I mean, there's, there's only one draft. So there's going to be a lot of guys not drafted um, just based on the numbers of, of guys that are putting their name in. There's, there's no longer nine, nine rounds. I'm in the NBA. So, um, you know, there's, there's just this kind of the nature of college basketball right now. And, and last question for now, just on, on Isaiah and, and Mason, as far as testing NBA waters, I guess, and just from your vantage point from being, you know, on the different levels and in the NBA, how difficult is it going to be on those guys? Cause it looks like, I don't know if you pay attention to mock drafts, but it looks like on mock drafts, they need to move up a little bit. Obviously try, everybody's trying to move up, but how difficult is it for them if they can't have those personal workouts or, or things like that? Yeah. I mean, again, I th- like, I think our big thing is just trying to, you know, obviously there's the, there's the mock drafts that are, um, you know, that are online that people can read and then NBA teams have their own mock drafts and, and, um, you know, there's, you know, a, a really, really 
you know, I thought an informative couple tweets um, about the, the, the Charlotte D League team and the and the accolades that the players on their D League team have. And, you know, I think that's something that, you know, really interesting for players to read um, what that particular one G League team looks like. And, and, you know, you're talking about guys that final four MVPs and, and, and defensive players of the year in their conference and players of the year in their conference and they're in the D League. It's, um, I know how hard it is to make an NBA team. Um, having coached it, I know how hard it is when you're in the G League to get a call up. Um, again, I think that, you know, as a, as a, as a coach, like our job, um, you know, it's, it's not just, it's not just myself that can get information, but, you know, Clay Mosier spent the last seven years out of the last eight years, seven of his years were in the NBA. So he certainly has direct contacts with people for information. Earl Boykins, you know, played over 10 years in the NBA. Earl's got great contacts. And then, and then it's up to, you know, coach Ruta, uh, was in the G League, so it's up to us to call our contacts and supply the information uh, to the particular player. And um, look, we've been through this with with three guys at Nevada, and they all came back. They listened, they dissected the information. Um, they came back, and it worked out really well for them. Two of them are in the NBA. One of them's in the G League. Um, another player. We, you know, we supplied the information. Um, he made his own decision. He's playing in Australia. So it's, you know, it's as a coach, you, you supply the information and, and uh, you support your guys. And, um, you know, basically everybody on a college roster wants to play um, in the NBA. And, you know, as a coach, you support them and you, you try to help them and you can call NBA teams and promote guys and, and get feedback, and that's that's really what we've tried to do over the last few weeks while we've been recruiting guys. Thanks, Coach. That's all I've got for now. Dudley? Hey, Coach. The, uh, up, Dudley? I know it's been, a, it's been over a year now, and you've had a chance to go out and see a lot of Arkansas high school basketball. Can you talk about the level of play there and and, uh, you know, the, the amount of prospects that you seem to have to, uh, you know, in-state to go after. Yeah, I mean, I, you know, I certainly, um, you know, this class, um, you know, was, was is really talented class. Um, you know, I, I mean, obviously, I mean, I don't even, I'm not sitting here with compliance, so I don't know how much more I can go into, um, you know, but I, I think, you know, every state, um, you know, has, you know, certain years where it's, it's really good. And then, you know, and certainly in this state, when you when you look over the next three years, there's, um, you know, there's two really, two really, really great classes. And, and this is one. And and um, then there's another one coming up soon. And, and so, um, you know, I think it's important that, that, that we get out we evaluate as much as possible. We continue to make as many contacts as we can um, communicate, um, you know, with high school coaches, whether it's through letters, whether it's through um, inviting them to practice, um, whether it's, um, you know, seeing them in November or seeing them in September um, when we're allowed to go out. So it's, I mean, I think there's a multitude of, of things involved in, in high school recruitment and, in the state and we feel like we've developed a lot of really good relationships with with high school and aau guys and so we just need to continue to do that as we get ready for you know for year two also just a general question about uh, prep school when kids uh, leave high school and go to prep school and are playing against division one uh players you know not only in practice but in the games as well how do you think that develops their game yeah, I mean, again, I, you know, um, you know, I think a lot, a lot of like success at the collegiate level comes down to, you know, especially with young players, is 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 understanding the work ethic involved. Under, you know, practices are are different. Certainly, um, you know, going against 
top level talent can can help players and can help them understand you know the level of competition and so forth but um you know i mean there's a lot of great you know I mean, some of the best coaches i've ever seen um are, are coaches that coach at small schools and and they do an incredible job of of getting their teams to play hard and getting their players to understand so i mean i you know i think it'd be too broad just to you know, just to talk about a prep school against the high school, because again, you know, some of my very best friends are, are coaching at, at smaller high schools and might not have college players year in and year out, but they might do the, a, a better job than a lot of college coaches in preparing young kids to, for life and, and understanding work ethic and being on time. And I mean, there's just so many factors that, that go into, you know, programs whether it be a, a high school program or a prep program appreciate it and, and by the way I won't be putting on that Padres cap anytime soon what's that I said I won't be putting on that Padres cap anytime soon <laughs> I got one for you I got a visor for you Scotty yeah, I wanted to go back to defense for just a minute. I'm curious how that, that process with him went because he was thinking the portal for like two days and jumped on board with you guys pretty quick. What was that, that time that time period like? Yeah, Scotty, I mean I think it's unique because um, you know, he's one of the very few players that when he transferred from Yukon, um, we recruited him really hard at Nevada. Um, obviously he was a Los Angeles, you know, player who went to Yukon, Nevada and California are close. Um, you know, we felt like that would, you know, we had recruited a lot of guys out of LA. Um, so we recruited him hard. And then obviously, you know, for Vance, I mean, he went in conference. He didn't come to Nevada, but he went to a school in our conference. And so we played him twice a year. Um, I think that that he, um, you know, saw the success of the team and the success of some individual players. Um, if we had not recruited him, you know, at Nevada, or if we had not um, had a personal relationship, um, it, the process probably would have taken a lot longer. We probably, you know, I don't know if we would have gotten a player six nine with his versatility, uh, but he he knew. Um, guys from the Nevada team that he could reach out directly to. I didn't, I didn't even know um, the first day went in the, went in the portal. I didn't even know he was talking to some of some of our players until after the fact. And you know, he verbally committed. And then some of the guys from Nevada started telling me that you know that they that they had talked to him. And so I think just playing in league, he could he could gather a lot more intel. Um, than just what we were saying to him. And, you know, I think, you know, when a player talks to another player, it probably carries a lot more weight than even a coach talking because, you know, players, you know, they, they, they give each other true, real feedback on stuff. And so, um, you know, and I think Vance knew, you know, knew that, that he wanted to come to a program that, that played a certain style as well. I appreciate it. Okay, I, well, I, I don't have 27 or whatever, but I, don't, I think I read somewhere that there were 500 guys in the transfer portal, and based on high risers or whatever side that is, they'd always say so and so's got, you know, blah, 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 and Arkansas on their list. So, how many guys did you evaluate? Would you say 25, 30? Would that be a an accurate ballpark figure? Maybe in a week. No, I, I mean, how many guys totally you reached out to just to, you know, check? I mean, we reached out to anyone that we thought was an SEC uh, roster caliber player. Uh, you know, and, and we kind of divide things up. Bob, is, is, he, is he a roster level player? Is he a rotation player? Is he a starter? Is he a top, top two or three? You know, and so, 
Um, and then, you know, obviously reaching out to a player to, you know, talk to him about, try to figure out his love for the game to try to figure out what his expectations are in his next stop. There's a lot of things that have to align, um, you know, for, for you to go all in on somebody and certainly an exploratory phone call. Um, we, you know, we don't offer players that are transfer scholarships. We don't call them and say, Hey, you have an Arkansas offer, um, with transfers. You know, we have communication with guys. Um, then we decide if we want to make a second call and a third call. Um, and then eventually it gets to the point of, you know, Hey, would you, you know, could you see yourself playing here? And, and, um, you know, I mean, we've been in, in, in top tens and had one or two conversations with the guys. So, um, you know, some, some, you know, some more realistic than others. And, and we don't put those lists out, obviously the players do. So, but certainly it, it's our job to explore every high school, every guy that's playing on the AAU circuit. It's our job to evaluate them. It's our job to try to talk to as many as we can and try to see which guys fit. With, with Vance and Jalen, you, you said you kind of rank guys as roster guys, rotation guys, potential, both guys as potential starters. I mean, I'd probably rather not go into that now but yeah we certainly feel like uh, both those guys have been starters their their whole career um you know and we certainly feel like they are talented and and uh and and and, and should you know could be guys that start for sure yeah i mean but but there's no i mean I, having said that i mean everything's done in training camps and you know, jobs are won when, when guys compete against each other. But both those guys have been starters throughout their career. Yeah. And then with Isaiah, I guess he's still got 10 days to declare for the draft. Um, do, you, do you know, has he, has he definitely not declared for the draft? Or do you expect him to declare just if, if for nothing else to, to test the waters? Or where do you think he is in that process? Yeah, I mean, I, I think that, you know, with Isaiah, that he, he and his family are talking, and, and, and I'm talking to, to Isaiah and to his family, and, and um, you know, I would expect him to probably test the waters. Um, that, that would be my gut feeling, but again, I think that that's, you know, the timing or, or whatever is, is, is really up to Isaiah. Um, you know, he and he and his dad, um, you know, we've, we've communicated with them on feedback stuff and they have great, great questions. Um, you know, we, you know, they're, they're really, really thinking through the process and, and, um, you know, they're asking all the right questions. And if we send them stuff, they call back and, and, and ask if we can dig a little further and, and, um, you know, right now, just phenomenal communication between, you know, uh, Derek and Isaiah, um, you know, in regards to to the NBA stuff, really phenomenal communication. Do you get a sense from Isaiah and his family if he's Liam coming back or Liam NBA or what, what, what sense do you get? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, really, Bob, I, I mean, you know, our thought is, that, um, you know, when at this particular time of the year, um, you know, he's certainly a player that, um, that he, you know, like if, if he wants to explore this thing, then I think you explore it and you do as much research and you don't, you know, you don't put odds on, on, on coming back. You just focus on the process and, and then, and then at some point you, you make a decision whether you stay in. Um, or you come back. And again, I mean, you know, like I want um, not just Isaiah, but like I want, you know, I want our other guys to know, like when you go through this process with us, that we've been through it with, with a lot of guys in a very, very short amount of time, um, you know, and, 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 and there's got to be a trust factor on, on what, what, what's best for the particular player. And so, 
Um, our job is just to try to, like I've stated over and over, is just to try to get as much information from, you know, Coach Mosier might have three people that he knows with one organization, and I might have two other people that I know. You know, Coach Ruda might know their G League guy. So we're just trying to, we're just trying to gather as much info as, as we can and, and, and not just get the feedback from the NBA undergraduate um, committee that, 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 that they have, you know, resources here that I think make us a lot different um, from some other places because of contacts and stuff. And then with, with the, this kind of off topic, I guess, with, with you know, the Bulls back coming out here Sunday, I have, uh, you, you were coaching the NBA the first year that Jordan and the Bulls won their title, and then the last year. Um, I was just wondering, what do you remember about, about coaching against those teams and what, what that was like? Yeah, I mean, uh, just great length in the backcourt. Um, you know, the size of of guys like, you know, I mean, it wasn't just MJ, but, you know, Harper. And and then they're up front guys, even that people don't really talk about, whether it was Sellers or, or uh, you know, Rodman. And, I mean, just Tony Kukoc. I mean, just. They were just so long. They, you know, they they executed the triangle offense so well, and you know, you took away a first or second option, and the triangle offense had four and five and six options, whether rather than a lot of NBA sets that maybe break down after two options. Um, and then you add in the fact that you know Jordan could go get his own shot at any time. Um, you know, and then the, I mean, I think anybody that, that that ever went into Chicago and played as a road team, just the pregame introductions. It's not often that there could be an intimidation factor at the NBA level in introductions, but that is the one building uh, that when Jordan's name was called and the music was playing, and their PA announcer had such a distinct voice that everybody in the basketball world recognized. I mean, it was the one spot that, you know, when you went in there, um, you know, you could you could feel the dominance of that team. And so Scotty Pippen, you, you didn't mention him. What was, what was it like Scotty Pippen? Yeah, I mean, again, just so many weapons. Um, you know, I mean, Pippen was, you know, everybody talks about positionless basketball and how it's new to the game and how the Warriors – created positionless basketball no I mean positionless basketball was created back with the Chicago Bulls um Pippen being that number I mean he still to this day might be the number one guy when you think of positionless basketball because he literally played the one to the five um you know he could bring the ball up the floor um he could guard a center um the ultimate you know Robin to you know, to, to, to Batman with, with MJ. And I've had one more question. Um, you, you, you put another video out, uh, the other day. I thought, I thought actually that was, that was the funniest one. Um, whose idea was that? And it was obviously very self-deprecating because you, you were playing the fan who would be critical of all the things you do. I don't know too many coaches, if, if any, that would, any others that would do that. Uh, who came up with that? And what was that like, kind of poke, poking fun at yourself? Uh, that was actually, you know, Pat Eckerman came up with the first idea um, in the empty practice, but but that one was actually uh, me. We were doing a virtual tour um, and and filming some stuff, and we were in an empty arena. And originally, my idea was to sit on a couch. Um, and watch a game as a fan in my home while on on the my TV screen we had a Arkansas game going, um, and then I just said, "Hey, film this real quick," and did it in the one take, and everybody liked it better than the idea of doing it in the in my living room on a couch. Um, so I'll take credit for that for that idea, actually, Bob. Most of them were somebody else, but that one was on me. Um. And have you actually heard fans? I mean, I'm sure you're into the game, so maybe you don't even pay attention to what fans might yell. 
But have you heard Fangio stuff like that, like substitute or call timeout or what, that, that stuff you, you did in the video? Have you actually heard people say that? I don't, I don't, me personally, I don't hear anything, but, um, you know, my wife actually likes to sit in the stands rather than sit in the suite. Um, she likes to feel the pulse of the game and feel the pulse of the fans and feel the emotion. And then obviously, you know, my two sons, one, one on the bench and, and, uh, you know, one that sits in the stands and, uh, my daughter's a parrot sometimes and will repeat what she hears. Um, and Danielle's pretty critical. Like she'll tell me like, Hey, even the guy next to me asked why you didn't call a timeout. So I know all that stuff is real. Um, I know it's being said, I don't hear it. Um, but yeah, I just wanted to have, have fun and just say, Hey, yeah, I know, I know this is out there. Um, you know, and then obviously some of the other comments about if we win the jump ball, we're going to win the game. Obviously that's just poking fun at, you know, somebody that really doesn't understand what goes into the game as well. Did you ever, like in high school, did you, did, did you ever do acting? Or did you act? I, I, I've never really done acting, but um, I guess with these videos, maybe, maybe that's my next career. If you can be up for the Twitter Emmys or something. <laughs> Okay, that's, that's all I got. All right, Bob, thank you. Uh, that wasn't quite 27. I counted 23. Okay. Well, <laughs> I, I can try to think of four more if you want. Well, yeah, I'm going to open everybody up here. Uh, we've probably got time for maybe two more. Does anybody have... Unmuted. Uh, Eric, as far as just with having more, looks like, you know, greater numbers, particularly with what I and Isaiah does come back, do you play more people with that setup? And, and you talked about really relying just one, you know, seven, eight guys tops. Would that change how you play? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, obviously, um, you know, I think that every coach should adapt to the roster they have. I think every year um, your team takes on a new identity. Uh, you know, when I coached in the G League, um, we played 10 guys uh, on basically every night. We, 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 we went 10 guys. I did it all the way back in the old CBA. I did it in the USBL um, because, you know, we felt like all 10 of those guys um, were all pretty equal in talent. So I think once we get into um, training camp, um, I, you know, I think players earn their minutes. Coaches don't give out minutes. Players earn minutes and, uh, players earn their role based on, you know, how they perform in practice, um, you know, how they perform in scrimmage settings. And so, um, what roles, you know, are kind of formulated, um, especially early on our first three or four games, that's going to be determined on how guys one, how guys are getting better right now on their own. And then also be determined once we get together and get back to, uh, to having practices and who competes and who, who meshes with each other, who blends the best and those, those type of things. All right. One last for Coach Musselman. I've got one. Hey, uh, Kyle, can you hear me okay? Yep. We'll hey, take uh, these two, and then we'll, be, we'll wrap it up. Okay. Coach can you hear me? Drew Van here. Yes, yep. What's up, okay, Tom? Hey, Coach, quick question. Go ahead, Drew. Can you hear me, Coach? Yeah. Yeah, Coach. Drew Van Just had a quick question about the video you had. The phone call to Devontae Davis. Whose idea was that? And how much did you have fun with that? Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, we, we, we started this, you know, this recruiting thing off doing, you know, pictures that had to do with, with NBA scenes. And and so um, just tried to, you know, how could we, how could we kind of wrap up, you know, this recruiting cycle with, with something that stuck along those lines. And obviously Iverson, you know, grabbing, grabbing 
Shaq shoe at the at the All Star game stuck out, and so we kind of went with that uh, as a theme for today. And and um, it, I guess that was another one of the ideas that I came up with. And so we rolled with it, try to have some fun, do something a little different. Thanks, hey, coach. All right, Trey, last one. Okay, I'm going to try to outdo Bob with the end of the teleconference oddball question. So, Coach, <laughs> I understand you can't answer this, but I'm sure there's been a point during this where you've you know, been on your treadmill or maybe watching Tiger King or something and your mind drifts off to how things might reopen or when things start reopening, how that might look, or maybe an idea that you had that you'd like to run by Anthony Fauci or Mark Emmert or Adam Silver or, uh, or something like that. Um, have any ideas like how this might look? I know you're not a medical expert or anything, but anything that you have like popped in your head about how things might look if they, if, as they reopen? No, I mean, I just, you know, I'm, I'm hopeful that, you know, when things, you know, reopen or we get back to normal, that we're back to normal as much normal as we, we can have. You know, I'm, again, I'm, I'm definitely not a medical person and obviously every decision that's made, you know, whether it's by the NCAA, whether it's by a conference, whether it's by, you know, government, whatever, whatever it is. I mean, everybody's kind of in it together and, and hopefully, you know, the decisions are, you know, they're going to be made for the best interest of the, of the student athletes health. Um, I'm at least hopeful that, you know, soon we're going to a football game and there's, you know, and there's fans and, and then that, turns into basketball season and, and we get back to normal. But again, you know, I have no idea any of the medical stuff. That's just what I'm, what I'm hoping for is to, to you know, very soon be watching coach Pittman on the football field and, and, uh, and, and, and be, and be sitting in the stands and, 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 and calling the hogs. That's what I hope. And, and have you watched Tiger King? I watched half of Tiger King. Um, my wife watched it all. Um, I guess I was not as intrigued with it as many others. <laughs> Thanks, Coach. I'd, I'd rather watch the 1980 Lakers than Tiger King. Yeah, or the Bulls coming out on the 19th. Last dance. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for your time. Yeah. Thanks, Kyle. Appreciate all you guys. Thank you. Thanks, everybody.